Hey, this is David Walensky back with another interview from the audio archives of Don't Die. Uh, this time I'm bringing to you the second half of my conversation with David Thomas, who's a former journalist, writer, critic, and also the co-author of the first comprehensive video game journalism style guide. Nowadays, he's the director of academic technology at the University of Colorado, Denver, uh, where academically he writes about fun, games, and technology. Uh, he and I spoke on March 15th, 2018. And uh, just a quick reminder, you can read all the interviews I've been doing the last few years over at nodontdie.com. Also, you'll see a link to my Patreon, where your support helps me continue on with this project. Uh, and now, here's David Thomas. I feel like uh, uh, I've seen a lot of this type of thing with, maybe it was BuzzFeed and uh, not picking on them specifically, but just sort of the rise of these pieces of like, I think just like the general elevation of pop culture and just sort of like, you know, trying to make you feel really smart because you watch whatever show. And I, mm-hmm. I, I, I and so what I wonder is, I wondered about that, but more specifically for you, like, is there a context where us coming up with new words um, may stop being useful and may just actually become a distraction for furthering whatever in video games? Yeah, I mean, it might. Uh, you know, at the same time, I'll tell you this, like, like I grew up, um, here's the taste, bitter, sour, sweet, right? Those are the yeah. tastes. And then, you know, it's become popular in the last few years to talk about umami, right? Yes. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't think that that causes the world to, to collapse, right? In fact, I mm-hmm. think it's really useful because there's a lot of us that are like, yeah, that's actually the thing that I like. It's not salty, it's umami, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think the games need that. And let me give you an example. So, I, like... I would, you know, people would say, what's your favorite game? I don't think that's a good question. I think that's, that's, that's like saying, you know, Hey, what's your favorite city? You know, it, it should, it should be more like what, what are some of the most meaningful experiences you've had traveling? You know, that's an easier question. So mm-hmm. if I were to think of like some of the things that affected me the most deeply playing games, one of those things was, um, one of the early, it was probably NFL Y2K or something, but it was one of the early 3d football games. And I've always been a casual football fan, but really never understood the game. And I remember running a play and something happened. I hit pause. I rewound it. I moved the camera around. And I probably studied that scene for five or ten minutes. Again, I'm not a scholar of the sport. And I finally understood how the whole thing worked, right? What do you call that? What's the word for that, right? Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you put that into a design document to say, I want to have those moments of discovery where the player – does something, you know, and I, I went to so many GDC talks and that's why guys like Clint Hawking were so entertaining to listen to, but guys like Will Wright were always trying to get everyone to understand there's just something and he didn't have the words for it, right? Mm-hmm. He's just like, I don't know. I always just thought that that was interesting. So I followed it, but then nobody knows how to do any, to do what Will did. They just know how to follow Will Wright's games. They just make more games like what he made. So right. I would argue with you that we need to design terms they really lock into those unique playing experiences that are, are so inherent to games and and bring us back over and over again. But we don't know how to describe them. We don't we don't have the umami words that we need. Yeah, I mean I'm not a game designer either, and what I wonder about is um, sort of sort of the way that I've found to legitimize you know a lot of this exploratory interviews I'm doing is is um, I am interested in a lot of things, but I'm also interested in just like what's it actually like for people day to day working at, at game companies, and you know what are what are the labor problems, what are the abuses, and obviously that's something that is uh, having its its moment in the, in the spotlight right now as well. Right. Um, and I find that there is such a limited vocabulary for that sort of thing um, within game culture, and then also communicating mm-hmm. about that outside of game culture. Like people always talk about crunch. Um, but I know that there's far more problems in games than just bad management. And crunch doesn't really describe um, the whole spectrum of abuses of, you know, failed management. Um, and so I, what I find often is, like, because we don't have many words, um, it makes the dynamic around talking about this stuff just, like, an argument among people who are simply proud of sacrificing themselves. And we focus less on people who are actually, like, you know, suffering and struggling and so i know with a lot of the language you were talking about it's just you know it's it's mechanics of games or it's game titles i mean what has sort of struck you about what's what's missing in talking about the people who make games 
Uh, you know, the, I, that's a good question. I mean, you know, partly as kind of being the journalist guy, you know, it's always carefully managed who you get to talk to, right? Yeah. And I had so many great conversations off the record with alcohol at, you know, at, at game developers conference. Um, but, but then, you know, you, you kind of realize, I think what you already said, which is it, it's, it's treated as an artistic industry, right? But these guys are like put into this blue collar situation, you know, <laughs> just they're, they're, they're chained to their desk. And, and, and I, I, I'll tell you, I'm going to go back to journalism real quick because I think that this is part of what's missing in the triad. I think the average game player knows more about frame rates and clipping and particle physics than they do about, you know, uh, whatever, you know, the, the fundamental joy and wonder of, you know, standing on a cliff and looking at the sun go down in a Grand Theft Auto game. Um, <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's because those joy and wonder moments are either a secondary output of the game itself, they're, they're second order. So the designer didn't sit down and go, you know what will be cool is someone's going to do this. It just it kind of it's the happenstance of the design process. Um, or it was decided by one guy, you know, one guy says, put a bench on this hill so players will stop and look at the sunset. And then it takes, you know, it takes a model or a couple hours to make the bench and it takes a texture artist a couple hours to make the texture. And then the, you know, and then so for everybody else, that, that brilliant artistic decision is deployed through this just like grinding, you know, effort. Yeah. And, and I, I, so I think that what's happened here is there has become a closed feedback loop between the consumer and the developer aggrandizing um the you know the inherent labor in in the creation of these games and i know that sounds really ridiculous except think about movies right mm -hmm. people don't talk about movies like that in fact they, they they go they go they go get a beer when the the oscar award comes up for best technical whatever right 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 they they kind of don't i mean what's the difference between sound effects and 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 you know Audio. Who knows? Who cares? Good. He won. I like that movie. Um, <laughs> and I think that that's that's why movies are such a dynamic piece of culture is because, you know, uh, if my kids get a game and they play, I say, how's the game? And they go, oh, it's really cool. Um, I unlocked a new gun or I unlocked a new parachute or I unlocked a new level. Right. Mm -hmm. But if my mom goes to a movie, you know, she doesn't say I, I found Julia Roberts performance to be very flat in the you know emotive. She would say. I, that was great. It was a really fun love story. It was really funny. And so my mom is more of a, of a cultural critic of film than my kids are of video games, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's nobody in the middle. I mean, we grew up talking about movies. We grew up playing video games and reading about how developers talk about it. So the long way around it is I, I think that you, what you see is what you get with game development. And I think it's transparent and I think it's expressed in the way players understand their games and the way players play their games. And this, again, from indie to AAA, right? Mm -hmm. Well, something I was wondering about is um, it was interesting. I don't think I've heard it put this way or something I've thought much about, but I know I've witnessed. Uh, and another term is I remember people were <laughs> – I remember, you remember, do you remember the debates about, are you a game journalist? Do you call yourself a game journalist? Are you just a journalist? What are you? Um, but you were talking about um, the game journalism world trying to professionalize and yeah. that it went in a direction that didn't make sense to you. Um, uh, so could you just talk a little about that, what, um, what you were observing and what you remember? Sure. I, the first thing I, I would, just to kind of put myself point in time, I had the exact opposite problem. I decided I wanted to be a game journalist. So people would introduce me and they'd say, hey, this is David. He's a journalist. I'd say, I'm a game journalist. I was always, <laughs> like, I was always trying to, you know, it took it took 10 years before people would, you know, like, like I was saying something offensive. Like, you know, no, I'm a game journalist. You don't have to say that. Shh, don't say that. Yeah. And so I, 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 I think that, that I, in retrospect, I think I was victim to what was happening to journalism as much as anything particular to game journalists. I mean, yeah. th there were, I, I mean, let's just face it, about the time that I was finally getting out, they started Polygon. I mean, Polygon's really based on a professional model, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, but, but, you know, there's one Polygon, there's not a lot of other, you know, uh, examples. I mean, 
near the end, you know, Kill Screen got started. And I, don't, I think Kill Screen's kind of, it's is it still even afloat. Is it, you know, or just a website now? Or uh, I was around when it started. Uh, and it went through a succession of different generations of management and uh, it more or less imploded and uh, is now like a culture company, whatever okay. that means. So, so I mean, that, so just so, but it's not, a, it's not a publication though. Yeah. Yeah, exactly what you described. I mean, I think I just kind of witnessed these these transformations of, of people like me and people that were interested in things. I was the the opportunities declined, mm-hmm. and um, it was harder to get paid to do something that wasn't turn and burn, game love, um, and uh, so you know, I, I kind of phased out, I, and so I, I think that that's. I, again, I, I don't think I have any particular insight. I think that what happened is the old model of professional journalism decayed into, you know, kind of internet hustle. Yes. And, and it, it may go through something in the future. I mean, you see little blips and blops of things that give you hope. But, um, you know, let, let's face it. We should probably be investing our, our time and money into to, to political reporting, not into game journalism right now. But, you know. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's funny because there there is always some sort of a um, reason to uh, back burner um, looking at games uh, more seriously or allowing more serious reporting about them. And, you know, not only is there that media problem and budgetary problem, but there is that thing as well as, um, you know, whether editors say they're burning out on covering the political landscape or not, obviously um, it's kind of sticky right now. And I don't think that, you know, you would be making the case for, hey, we, you, hey, New York Times, you need to cover <laughs> E3 this summer. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, it is kind of funny, isn't it? I mean, when you think about it, it's like, you know, we, we get so focused on, on games that we, we never really think about. Like, yeah, the New York Times is, is to the point where it's got to make a choice. Do I send a guy to a three-day holiday in L.A. called E3 or do I, you know, send a reporter down to City Hall to figure out, you know, what's going on there? It's, well, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I just I think I think that we need to respect the fact that game journalism is probably a mess, but it's probably because it's journalism and it's in, under the same pressures that all other forms of journalism are. Mm-hmm. Well, I was just going to ask. I mean, what do you sense? Because based on our emails, it sounds like you still follow along and and uh, are are conversant and and uh, are uh, current with uh, with games writing and journalism. I mean, what do you sense? Um, other than a reference guide, <laughs> what do you sense that the game uh, writing world um, would benefit from these days? Um, yeah. I'm not asking you to call anyone out individually. No, no, it's, uh, of it's course a, you can. It's a good question. Um, you know, I don't I don't read a lot about games these days. Uh, I mean, I, I see stuff on Facebook or you know something will kind of come across. Um, for two reasons, one is I don't play a lot of games now, and that has partly to do just like you know, how my leisure time works and having kids that dominate the, the game system. Um, so, so it's like, so, you know, a lot of the journalism is still about games, you know, like, like what's coming next or, you know, what, yeah. levels. and so I just, you know, I don't, there's not a lot there for me. And then I, there's not a lot of analysis. Every once in a while I catch something, you know, something comes across a news feed. It's usually a culture piece. So I think what I'm missing is I'm really missing, uh, let's just say I haven't found my outlet, right? I mean, there's, there's no, there's no publication that I know of for guys like me that want to read stuff that some days is deep. Some days is funny. Mm -hmm. Um, You you know, to, to, to take it back to what we were talking about, where's the Lester bangs of journalism, I think is a great question because I don't think there ever has been. I think that the people that have come closest to us are probably people honestly like Sean baby or Tim Rogers. I mean, people that are just considered to be kind of nutty outliers, but I'm like, I think that in their, in their unbridled love of the medium and their willingness to just go for broke and everything they wrote, I think they were getting closer to the heart of what I like about games. I, I mm-hmm. like the weirdness. I like I like their irony. I like the fact that they don't make sense. You know, um, you know. Another one of my favorite gaming moments is you know my kids playing Skyrim a couple of years ago, and I this is after I was really writing it seriously about games, so I hadn't played it. And he's wandering through a forest, and then he takes this sharp detour, and he starts killing this giant. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm attacking this giant. Why are you attacking this giant? Well, because he's bad. 
I'm like, well, he was just, he was just standing there. He wasn't doing anything. He goes, well, if he would have saw me, he would have tried to kill me. I go, he didn't. So, so basically you're saying you murdered this giant just, you know, yeah, yeah. and I'm getting him all wound up. Like, so this is just a murder simulator. You know, I'm using all the rhetoric of the aim, yeah. aim stuff and it got him so worked up, but it was so funny to me because I was like, well, it is what it is, isn't it? I mean, he really did just go commit murder of this creature for no reason in this world that allows it. It probably even incentivizes it. And it forces him into this contradiction of who he is versus what he's doing. And I think that's great. I mean, it's just it's messy. And I, by, by the way, I didn't take the game away from him. You know, I did. It just it was just funny to me. <laughs> and so I want the Lester Bangs of game journalism. So I read about people that are just doing weird things with their games or they're encountering their games in weird ways or they're just, you know, they're making me laugh about, you know. Yeah. They, what's, what's considered comedy in, in, in game writing now is clip reels of funny things that happen in games. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even get it. It's like I really – I honestly do not understand. I'm like, oh, cool. The car flipped up and landed and sitting on its end crazy you know yeah i mean it's funny because you mentioned that fun factor is coming has come out of fashion but i mean i don't think i could have ever predicted maybe you could have um you know uh 20 years ago that these days how self-serious so much stuff around video games is um i, I, I mean do you predicted that you're right i would not have ever said I, I yeah um, which I don't necessarily have any question about. It's just it's 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 weird how that has uh, materialized. And um, so, what I, caused it? What what caused us to get serious about games? Do you think it overlaps with the barriers to entry sort of falling away, where more people can make their own stuff, and then it becomes you know a money a money thing, which of course people. You know, that people tend to get serious over money. I mean, do you think it overlaps with that or do you think it comes from somewhere else? It's a good question. I, don't, I mean, I really don't know. I, you know, it, it really, you know, objectively, you know, I got a kid that's a huge Team Fortress 2 player in those kinds of games. And I just yeah. stand there and look at him. I'm like, why are you doing that? You're not having, you're enjoying it. Why don't you stop? You know? Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, I think I don't. I think it's like uh, observationally, people aren't enjoying games as much as maybe they used to. I think that personally, you kind of look at it. I mean, look, I'm the guy that played Marathon until he couldn't move his hand on his Mac mouse. You know, I, was, but, <laughs> I mean, I'm not I'm not above anybody, but you look at it and you're like going, maybe there's something wrong with video games. Maybe it's not games. Maybe it's video games. Maybe the the the, the Pavlovian feedback loop is so intense that you know. All games are grind, and 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 we're so saturated with media that we we'd, we'd rather just you know keep pushing the the Skinner box button. I, I don't know. I mean, I really just throwing these things out because when you say people are serious about games, I'm like, yeah, what happened? What, what they're supposed to be joyful. They're supposed to be fun, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why I stopped playing them. It's because I I I got a little girl. She's nine years old, you know. I get joy from her. I don't. I don't have to kill giants anymore. <laughs> well, you had said um, that a lot of game history is mostly hyperbole. I mean, what do you what do you think is the the, the truth that's maybe being blown out of proportion uh, day in day out? Like, what do you think is actually you know what's actually going on day to day? Um. Well, I was referring to a lot of the the game history books because we tend to. Well, let me just. I'll put it to you this way. Yeah. Um. I read Ready Player One, and I, I enjoyed it, but I, I really felt like I should not have read that book because it's a terrible book. It's got mm -hmm. terrible characters. Everything about it is terrible. I, but, you know, I'm the target market, so I get all the references and I get those dopamine hits. <laughs> um, and, and it creates this sense of nostalgia, right? And so Ready Player One makes everyone nostalgic for those old arcades, right? But I'm old enough to remember those old arcades, right? And, I, and I, I get infected by that nostalgia, and I miss that. But then, I don't know, like a couple months ago, I took the nine-year-old to – she's eight then – to a classic arcade near our house where you pay a price and you can play all the games. And I'm, I'm having my nostalgia. And she's getting really, really frustrated. And she says, Daddy, these games are really hard, right? Like she's not having fun. 
Yeah. And I say, oh, and I explained to her, yeah, they used to use quarters and, you know, they wanted to take as many quarters out of your pocket as possible. So they made them hard so you'd lose and have to put more quarters into it. Just push the little button. You can get as many lives as you want. And she's like, okay. And then she started playing Rampage with her friend and they had a delightful time, right? But but that's where I, I have to go back and say, wait a minute. Those arcades were horrible. They were dark. You went in with as much money as you could scrape together. You left with none. You <laughs> spent a lot of time hanging around. You got bullied by bigger kids. You yeah. know, it's only with the, the, the with in retrospect, they were the best years. Of, they were not the best years of your life. They were just, they were cool. They were interesting. They were a part of life. And and, and, and we're, we're in this crazy cycle. And so I just, I, I look at the video game histories and I think most of them are like, this was the greatest thing ever. And and then and then people go back and go, well, Mist really wasn't that good. I'm like, you don't understand. Mist was everything. I mean, Mist was the portal to another dimension. And like we've got our we we've rewritten all of our histories in reverse, you know? Like all of a sudden, like Castlevania is the greatest game ever made. Look, I don't even know who played Castlevania when I was a kid. I did, but I <laughs> I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like people like they, they pick all these old games that they just love to death. And and I'm like, that's fine, but that's not that's not a historical perspective, right? That's a peculiar modern uh richness that allows us to be obsessive about something from the past. I've met people half my age that know more about the games that I grew up with than I do. And I'm not cynical. I just I sort of think it's weird. And so I do think that we have to be really careful with our game histories because there there is a ton of hyperbole in them. And like in, in your project, one of the things that I think is really important is that you're going back and you're talking to some of the women that were were have been through this history mm-hmm. and, and finally have a little bit of voice. And you read what they say and they're basically like, hey, it wasn't as great as everybody says it was if you were a girl. Right. Right. And I think mm-hmm. those are some really strong reminders that that our histories are really, really cockeyed. Right. Well, they're selective. Well, I mean, I yes, yeah. I mean, I actually, um, I just have a couple more here for you, but I want to go back to something you had said, which was about just sort of the slowing of uh, games evolving, which I think probably describes what the last twenty years, where it's just sort of they haven't changed majorly. Um, I feel like I see this phrase all the time, and I saw this the other day, <laughs> which is someone talking about blank game being a huge step forward for storytelling in games. Mm. And um, it, it's like well, before we were talking about where I was talking about people saying, you know, video games won. Uh, I don't know what that means, huge step forward for storytelling. And I don't know that you need to have a response, but I mean... If that's true, like, where are we going with our stories and games? Because I don't feel like I've seen anything really all that new or the game around the story being that unfamiliar. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you'd probably – it's a great question to ask some of the, the people that, that, you know, wrote narrative for games. I, I think what they're getting at is, you know, there was a time – like, I mean, Mario 64 is probably as good a game as ever been made, you know, and it didn't have a story. You know, it just, it was just, you ran around and did stuff and it was cool. And, you know, you're saving some princess, whatever. Yeah. And, and I, and I think, you know, Mist had a story. It wasn't probably a super deep story or interesting story. So I think that if you're a narrative kind of person, some of those old CD-ROM games felt like they were narrative, you know, the, the old Tim Schafer, you know, LucasArts games, those were, they had little funny stories in them. So I think now it's like people have confused scale with, with narrative quality. I mean, like, again, I'm like, Oh, interesting. My kid was playing the new Assassin's Creed, the 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 you know the one set in Egypt, the Egypt one, yeah. And I'd sit down and play with him, but you know I'd kind of make him like, well, what's going on, right? And man, it it makes any given Netflix series like <laughs> seem really simple in comparison. Yeah, it's just it's baroque in the worst sense of the world, and I don't know if that's what people mean by by you know it's finally taking narrative steps is because they kind of feel like, well, now it's complicated enough. You know, there's enough things going on in it that I mm-hmm. feel like somehow this is an important world. It's a narrative world. Um, y- you know, I-, I-, I really think it's, I mean, I, I think if-, if I were a person who really went to games for narrative, that's what I'd be looking for, which was this complexity. But, but I think it's, it's to my mind, it's a very strange measure of game success. Since I want, lots yeah. of don't have stories at all. I wonder how much of this sort of praising of games in that hyperbolic way 
you know, it, you know, and this can come from people who, you know, this is on their their own blog or their own YouTube thing or you know, uh, the uh, it, I'm, I'm I was quoting there from like someone from the Washington Post where they're writing about that and it's someone who I know is is knowledgeable about games and has covered games for a long time. I mean, I wonder how much of that just comes from people who have a lot of time invested into games and so there's almost like this this mental like trickery that's happening where they're saying well i spend a lot of time on this thing so it has to be really good and valuable right like for me i never understood well yeah. it, it can't are we I, i've always sort of wondered like are we just expecting too much of games isn't it fine that it distracted us for a little bit and it doesn't need to <laughs> be some sort of life altering experience and that in fact it's actually valuable because it wasn't trying to do that so i mean I, I i always wonder about that but that may just be my hang up and and not the people writing those reviews no i i, I think you know games are a broad church and they, they certainly should admit dirty but i i do think yeah that i i am like you i get high centered when the, the old days it used to be in whatever final fantasy 7 it's just like did you cry when eris died and i'm like are you crazy like you know <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the story doesn't even make any sense, you know, for me, much less. You know, the, the only time I can think of in my entire game career, the thousands of games I've ever played, that I ever even thought about crying was with the original Animal Crossing. Um, a little town set up, you know, like, like most people, I invested way too much time in building and yeah. collecting. And then I, I, my, one of my kids at the time, he was young, I was like six or seven, and he, I set up him with an account in my town so we could trade letters, right? And I came home one day after playing this game, you know, insanely amounts, large amounts of time, and he had deleted the town, right? Oh, no. And I said, I said, Sam, you, you deleted Beamtown. It's gone. <laughs> like, and I was, I was kind of like in shock, like at all the time I'd spent on this. And he started to cry. And that's the only time I can think about I ever wanted to cry about a video game is because he and I, these two human beings lost something between us, you know? Hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't, you know, and maybe I'm weird, but, uh, I, I don't, I've, I've not, the, the narratives of video games just, they're not, they're not vivid enough for me, I guess. It's, they can be scary. I can be scared easily by games, but not, not, I don't get emotionally invested in the, in the characters. And yeah. it, so that may just be me. So I may be the worst person to ask. But. No, I, I run into that too and run into other people who feel differently, which is fine. Um, so, uh, Real quick, I mean, you know, we talked about this book, and I know that you mentioned uh, in our email some people, I feel like only in video games can you say this, where someone puts out a reference guide and <laughs> someone takes umbrage with it. But you said people, were, some people were like, how dare you? Oh, yeah. So uh, I, I guess I'm curious, like, what was behind that? And just, you know, did the book also have a, a you know, a uniting effect? Do you feel it was successful? I was just surprised to read that. A reference guide was put out and it, it upset people. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, okay. So the first thing is, remember the, the the sort of the junior high, everyone's kind of jockeying for position, right? Yeah. Of course, anything you do to to raise your profile causes other people to feel like they got to take you down a peg, especially if they're you know mm -hmm. competitive, right? Um, I mean, that's just that's the nature of it. Like, who 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 are these guys that write for these little magazines and newspapers to tell us the the elites that go to everything how to think about games, right? And it's, yeah. there's a, there's a rationale that argument, um, and and I, and I think too some of it too had a lot to do with this, which is um, a lot of the people that were criticizing the game journalism style guide didn't know what a style guide was, right? Yeah, they never they you know I mean I I grew up in an in industry where you had to do things according to AP style and it's fairly long and complex but like you learn you don't use an Oxford comma right you get smacked upside the head if you keep doing that so you just stop right and then you start to learn to use the style guide so that your editors like you and and will, you know will give you more assignments <laughs> yes yeah um, and you know I don't know how many times we had to tell people to say it's a style guide. You don't have to follow it. But if you are trying to run a publication, for example, you are welcome to write one. Why not just use this one? Um, I think there was something that we never got in there, but I wish was in there. It's like, what is the appropriate plural for more than one dwarf, right? I mean, only only in video games do you have to talk about how many dwarfs <laughs> there are. Is it dwarves or dwarfs, you know? 
I feel like it's dwarves. Well, but. you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think I don't know get in there. But wouldn't it be nice if the publication you're working for said it's dwarves with a V, right? You'd be like, <laughs> works for me. Get it right. Yes. And so <laughs> so so I, I think that's why, you know, to this day, Dan Shu is one of my favorite peoples in the world because he he adopted the style guide for EGM because he was like, this is helpful to me. And, you know, so video game, one or two words for the record. Kyle Orland was adamant that it was two words. And Scott Steinberg and I both voted for one word. So the only reason it's one word in that style guide is because it was two to one. He was outvoted. It, but, but the thing is, is even, even at that, I think it even says in the introduction or something, something along the lines, if you want it to be two words in your publication, make it two words. Um, but but I, again, I, I would use that more as a bellwether for the, 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 the truly lack of professionalism across the board. You know, even even in some of the enthusiast magazines, you know, they just they, they, they weren't necessarily I mean, some some of these folks did come up through, you know, more traditional journalistic preparation. But as things got fast, a lot of these people never did. You know, they never and especially with the blogs, they never they never had a J class. They never had an actual professional editor. And yeah. so I, so I think that, you know, the style guide probably seemed a little stuffy. And, uh, you know, years later, it's it was, it's probably both. It probably was stuffy. But it probably also was the right thing that, that it probably should have gotten legs and it stuck around. It's funny because in my own career, that's usually something I ask at the outset when I start writing for a new place, um, not to seem stuffy, but just because it's helpful. And I think that's part of what the work is when you write for a place is I would ask, do you have a style guide? Mm-hmm. And it has to be years since I was sent one. I don't, I mean, I have to assume people have an internal one, but I don't even know if they share those with freelancers anymore. I, I don't know. I mean, I knew when fact checkers started to get laid off that more or less things were going to head in the direction that they're, they're in now. So it just seems to be the state of things. Um, but, but but let me ask you this. I mean, I, I did note <clears throat> in your email to me, um, you know, you mentioned that thing with Gus, just sort of you're realizing no longer becomes worth your while. Yeah. And, um, you know, you talk about dropping the label game journalist and sort of, you know, just continually walking away from uh, you're continually walking away from, you know, doing this work. And yeah, yeah. I was wondering, you know, in, in hindsight, I mean, it, was it bittersweet? Do you see it as a positive thing to walk away? I mean, well, what, did, what, did, what did you aspire yeah. to? You're, you're catching I mean, kind of a point of like maturity now. Um, it was very bittersweet. I, mean, I remember something really particular, and I, I can't remember if it was in the email or not, but this was on Kyle's old game journals list, the, the, the initial flashpoint for Gamergate. But there had, yeah. been, uh, there had been this new Sony commercial – and I can't, I can't remember because I've had several that were kind of like it, but it was basically like a bunch of kids with guns just blowing each other away, you know? And and I wrote and it was just kind of like, I think this is too much. I think this is really aggrandizing violence, not play, you know? I mean, maybe we should think about this. And, you know, there's a lot of professionals on this list and I got kind of shouted down, you know, except for Gus. I remember him saying something like, you know, in, in his own, you know, Gus isn't a, He's like a really a bringer together kind of guy, as far as I can tell. He says something really measured, like, yeah, it's probably something we should look at. But but the rest were just kind of like, like you're almost like you're not a gamer if you don't think that that's fucking awesome, you know. And <laughs> and, and I was kind of like starting to think more and more, like, well, maybe I'm not a gamer, like if that's what a gamer is. And and I also realized that you know, uh, I, I mean, I'm 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 not old old, but I was getting to the point where I'm looking at these guys that are. 25 years old that are willing to spend, you know, they're making $40,000 a year living in Brooklyn. And, and, and this is the best job they've ever had. And they spend, you know, 15, 16, 18 hours a day playing video games. And I got a job, I got a family, you know, trying to squeeze in four or five hours of play to write something was getting harder and harder. And so, and for a while I justified it with, I'm a better writer. I'm a more efficient writer. I know more than they do. I have better analysis, so I don't have to spend as much time. But there was a point in time where I'm like going, I think I'm underserving the reader, right? Like, yeah. like I'm, I'm like, I can play a game for four hours and tell you if it's any good. But that guy played through 40 hours and finished the game, right? And so, and I'm like thinking, and I think the readers want to know the whole thing. And so, so it was a part of me starting to opt out a little bit. 
but then very, very much like, like Gus's interview, um, the opportunities were drying up, man. It was just getting harder and harder to find mm-hmm. work. Um, you know, most of the work was just game reviews. Um, you start to fall into the vicious cycle if you if you're not attached to an outlet. It was getting harder to get review copies. Then we were getting up to the next hardware console turnover. You know, if you're not, you know, then you you go from being invited to the release parties to begging for a console that you can review on. Right. And there was just a point where I'm like, I'm gonna phase to to doing editorial work for magazines. So I really worked hard on working for. Uh, um, what was it? Edge and, and uh, um, just a little bit for Wired and a bunch for EGM, and mm-hmm. and that was fun because I was doing features and stuff. It wasn't a lot of money, but you know. And then and then I had this this really ugly experience with um, Edge, and basically they assigned me a profile of Felicia Day, and her publicist started questioning my credentials and pulling strings and wanted to see my questions and. And I just started to feel like this isn't even journalism, right? I'm like, I'm writing PR copy. And, you know, my editor wasn't the main editor. It was Jason Killingsworth, great guy. And, you know, he backed me. But, you know, it kind of fell apart. And I just, I was like, I'm killing myself for a couple hundred bucks a month, you know? Uh. And it just wasn't fun anymore. And I, I, I punched every button on everything I ever wanted to do. And, you know, and you know, the the let's just be honest that the two hard things to wean yourself off of are the as the access and the freebies, right? It's true. I mean, I think like, those are the two main things that attract people to that work. Yeah, I mean, video games are just really expensive, and you know, and and I, you know, like so many people for years, they just they flooded in the the door, you know. And so, you know, weaning yourself from that was a little hard. I think my 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 two teenage boys now they were a. Uh, they were aghast when the game stopped coming in, you know, like, what? Oh, totally. Why, uh, how could you do this? Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I did some transitional stuff. I wrote I wrote some more featurey stuff, and then I ended up writing these educational reviews for, for um, Common Sense Media. So, so now all these this years later, I, I'm, I'm, inter- I'm working on a book pro- another book project about fun, and I'm, I'm using my skills to explore things I'm interested in. And, and I miss games, and I'll tell you, I still get a pang every year when GDC rolls around. I get a pang every time I read about my buddies, you know, loading up for another E3. And you know, mm-hmm. I mean, as, as much derision as I've heaped on uh, um, on Ready Player One, you know, I would be at the party if I could get into it. That whatever will be E3, <laughs> you know, I, I miss yeah. I miss the, the I mean, I went to 14 or 15 E3s, so it was getting to be a little bit routine, but I still, I miss the thrill. I miss it, you know? But It's funny. I mean, uh, I don't know how many writers I've interviewed for this. I sort of put off interviewing other writers because I really wanted to hear from people whose experiences were not like my own. And even still today, I'm like, I don't know how interesting these conversations are to people who aren't writers. And I don't know if that's just like a writer thing or if that's an internet thing or a video game thing. Um, But there was an email I got earlier this week that I made a point of... uh, copying uh, just a quick excerpt and then I'll ask you one more question and let you go um, but she had emailed me Monday mm-hmm. uh, and she's a publicist for a, a, a UK game company and she was just asking about I think she only now is starting to sense that um, things are hard for writers and mm-hmm. uh, I was just like she's just asking me to just to talk about it just like email her about it just sort of fill her in like yeah. are things getting harder for writers on the internet and uh uh she said um she said i'm interested in movements in games journalism circles because too often the people on my list end up just being names on a list i meet with a team one week and f- find they've all been fired and replaced with the interns who were doing the same work <laughs> for no money the week before it's a mess and uh, you know, when I look at the organization you were a part of in the book, I mean, I think I think it's, it is that sort of professionalizing you're talking about. But uh, I mean, what do you think someone who only interacts with writers in terms of pitching them on writing about their games misses about the bigger picture of what it means to to do this sort of work? You know, listening to that, I mean, it's sad. Um, yeah. But I, I also think, you know, it makes me realize something. Um, as much as I tooted my horn about professionalizing game journalism, I think game journalism was never professional, right? I mean, it was never professional in the sense that it was a career you prepared for, that had standards that you you know you would advance in. Mm-hmm. It was it was like 
I don't know. It was just amazing game itself. I mean, it, it was fun. It's always been fun being a game writer, right? It was a blast. I mean, you know, how fun is it to be the, the first guy in your city to have a, an Xbox, you know? How fun? I mean, I've talked to everybody. I've, I've interviewed Miyamoto, you know, Will Wright, uh, anybody, name them. Kojima, I've, I've interviewed them all. I mean, like, I used to, like, kids would just, like, you know, they thought I was, like, amazing because I was doing what they wanted to do, right? And 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 I think that what people may miss about game journalists and, and I think even maybe some of my colleagues may disagree, but miss this is that, um, being a game journalist was sort of considered to be a really cool way to be a gamer, right? Like, like what a great way to be a gamer, to get it early, to get it free, to get access, to get paid to do it, to get paid a little bit to do it, but it was never yeah. a profession, like something that you actually would do when it wasn't fun. You would do when it was hard that, you know, um, I, 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 and I, 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 maybe it's changed, you know, because there's so few people now that probably appropriately make a living as a game journalist. And maybe that's what editors missed, right? Editors missed the fact that we were all just big kids and, and you know, I, we were just, you know, I mean, I'm going to tell you something that you know and that people don't really like to talk about, but um, – and I don't, I don't know if it's still this way, but in the, in the, in the day – you would balance your coverage in part based on not what you were writing about, but what it got you next, right? Mm. I mean, you're not going to blow off the, the big thing that Sony's pushing a month before E3, lest your, you know, party pass never shows up. Um, it's just you know, and I, you know, I, mean, I feel I feel awful thinking about that in a sense, but but in another sense, I'm like, we were paid to do that, right? We weren't paid mm. to miss the Sony party. Our readers did not were not interested in our journalistic ethics. Our readers were interested in what was it like to hear whatever Beck play at the Sony party. <laughs> I mean, they really, really were. And so, so I think that that there was always this facade of professionalism. There was always this this kind of. Um, and, and again, remember my position. I mean, maybe the guys at the magazines would feel differently, but I can't imagine much because I watched the, what they did like everyone else. But I, but I think that that. You know, games journalism in, in relationship to the industry, it was always very transactional. Um, and I think that the the best PR people I worked with were totally cool with that, right? Mm -hmm. They, they kind of got it and they understood it. And, um, and you know, we would, we would try to pretend that there was a, a firewall between PR and, and, and journalists, you know, and we'd try to do things like not date, you know, across the lines or whatever, but, you know. And, and we'd make fun of the people that that went too far, that co-opted themselves too much. Um, but uh, but I think I think that's probably that's probably what happened. Here's what I don't know. I don't know what it's like today. I, I can only imagine that it's not that different, you know. <laughs> I think it's like that, but also uh, infinitely more self-serious and uh, just, yeah. just constant just constant opinion pieces. Well, th there's that. Yeah. Well, here's the, here's your question. Yeah. What what do you report on? Right. <laughs> what do you actually do reporting on? Two sources. You know, get facts, do research. I mean, you know, we, we kind of live in the era of commentary. I'm interested in doing reporting. That sort of, I think it's I think it's a stupidly difficult task uh, of trying to acknowledge the sort of gaps in this knowledge. You know catch people up and then actually report on something um, that is newsworthy. I think uh, <laughs> I think editors may only have the patience for two of those three, but not all three. Yeah. I think that's just sort of where things are at right now. Um, well, that's where I, 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 I can't say, you know, across the board, but often that seems to be. But I think that's, that's a reflection in part of games and of media. I mean, editors are... Uh, underpaid and overworked and why wouldn't you just you know go why would you green light work like this um if you have stuff that you immediately get and you you know right I, I as i understand it now it's it's more about a traffic quota i can't remember it's it's wouldn't surprise it, me. I, I don't know all the specifics but let me ask you one last thing and then i'll, I'll let you go and this is a, the big big question i ask everyone um what do you feel video games have accomplished 
Um, well, they brought computers to the mainstream. Uh, you know, I mean, in in many respects, um, uh, this is probably high minded. I, I I have this really strong belief that um, that the West has been operating under this beauty aesthetic, which is really kind of based in this. For us, it's this kind of peculiar British empirical scientific model. It's this rational model, and I think games actually showed us that we really do have a a desire and a need for fantasy and wonder and joy that, you know, um, th- that we really wanted, ex- we wanted a different experience in life. And I know that sounds really kind of like kind of high minded or f- f- froofy, but it's just, it's about, it's about recognizing that, that there, there's, there's, there's more to, to life than, you know, showing up at the factory and getting old, having kids and dying, I guess. Um, I really, I really do think that video games are, are crazy and I think they're supposed to be. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, it's probably why, you know, and, and when you look at it, you really think about it. If you pick who our great designers are, they're wacky guys, you know, and, and some women should be more. But, you know, you look at like Miyamoto has been trying to tell us for 30 years, games are supposed to be silly. You know, there, there's Will Wright saying that games are supposed to just be wacky. I mean, he's all, you know. He's the guy that's always had wackiness in his quote unquote simulations, flying saucers that destroy cities and, you know, and, and having to manage your, your Sims because they have to go to the bathroom. I mean, just crazy stuff. I, 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 I think that games are at their best when they're just sort of like insane. Um, we need that escape. So maybe games have accomplished that. Maybe games have just made us a little more open to a, a, a very kind of complicated you know, wonderful world. I, I, I don't, I don't know that that's right, but it's kind of how I feel about it these days.